tanks have dominated land warfare since before World War II. Today, the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies have a vastly superior number of tanks available for combat than have the NATO forces. The United States Army is considering several means to counter this threat. One of the most promising is the attack helicopter a concept which had its origin in the early 1950s when forward thinkers in the army experimented by mounting machine guns on observation helicopters to deliver fire against point targets. These helicopters were later employed in teams to perform as scouts. Their tactics were to pop up from behind masking terrain, fire their weapons, then disappear again behind the mask. Soon rockets were added to these scout helicopters to provide suppressive fire over a larger area. Then to increase the volume of this suppressive fire, rockets were placed on cargo and utility helicopters. The range of these rockets enabled the helicopters to fire and then break off their attack to avoid overflying the target. In the late 50s, the Army mounted wire-guided anti-tank missiles on the helicopter and investigated their use against armor. Throughout this era, a continuing concern was the survivability of the helicopter. It still had to prove itself in combat. The United States involvement in the Vietnam conflict heralded the first use of armed helicopters in actual combat. The newly developed UH-1A helicopter called the Huey armed with fixed position machine guns, was selected to escort the troop carrying helicopters. These gunships initially operated at low level, but the fixed position of their machine guns made it necessary to climb to altitude in order to fire effectively. Because the landing zones were frequently beyond the range of friendly artillery, rocket pods were installed on the Hueys to provide suppressive fire prior to the landing of the troop carriers. The armed Hueys would orbit the landing zone continually while the troop carriers were landing and departing. This role rapidly expanded. Operating in teams, the helicopters began to provide supporting fires for ground forces. Improved rocket warheads and rapid fire, flexibly mounted machine guns on later models of the Huey permitted the helicopter to deliver even more accurate fire while staying out of range of enemy ground fire. It soon became evident that the hours of darkness belonged to the enemy. So clusters of airplane landing lights were mounted on helicopters, enabling them to illuminate areas at night. Accompanying these light ships, known as fireflies, were blacked out armed Hueys, which engaged any enemy sighted. The success of these modified helicopters gave rise to the Army's requirement for a full-time attack helicopter. The state of the art, however, could not yet provide what the Army wanted. So it settled for an interim attack helicopter in the form of an improved Huey. During this period, the 11th Air Assault Division at Fort Benning, Georgia, was evaluating various tactics and techniques for using the helicopter. Many of its tactics had already been adopted by the helicopter units in Vietnam. With the redesignation of this unit as the 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile, and its subsequent deployment to Vietnam came a new era in helicopter employment. For the first time, large units were organized around the mobility and firepower of the helicopter. This division combined scout helicopters and gunships into teams. The small observation helicopter operated on the treetops searching for the enemy, while the armed helicopter remained at altitude ready to engage any targets detected by the scouts. It introduced the use of the armed helicopter as an extension of conventional artillery. One of these heavily armed helicopters could deliver firepower equivalent to a one-round volley 
by a 105 artillery battalion. This helicopter was a mobile observation post, fire direction center, and gun position all in one, ready to respond to all requests. In 1967, a slimmed down version of the Huey called the AH-1G Cobra was introduced in Vietnam. This was the first helicopter designed specifically as an aerial weapons platform. The introduction of the OH-6 light observation helicopter at about this same time provided the Army with a new, small, agile aircraft to perform the low-flying scout role. This machine, when coupled with the Cobra, made a team that was a formidable adversary for the Viet Cong. The tactics of employment of the attack helicopter in Vietnam evolved primarily as a result of the weapons systems available and the nature of the enemy threat. In Vietnam, the Army learned that even an armed helicopter operating alone and with unvarying tactics was vulnerable to enemy ground fire. So they operated in teams for mutual support and varied their mode of operation. The Army learned that to effectively combat the enemy, its helicopters must have a near all-weather, day and night capability. It learned the most effective employment of the helicopter in low-intensity combat was at an altitude of 1,200 feet where it was least vulnerable to ground fire and its weapons were most effective. The less expensive, more agile light observation helicopter could effectively locate targets for the hard-hitting gunship. Above all, the Army learned that the helicopter could survive in a very hostile environment. The success of the helicopter in Vietnam convinced the Army that it should consider seriously the question of whether or not the helicopter could be effectively employed in an anti-tank role. The Army began a systematic and exhaustive series of investigations into the use of helicopters against an armored threat in a mid-intensity conflict. Bits and pieces of information began to emerge. Much of what was learned was only common sense. But never before had the Army so exhaustively analyzed tactics, techniques, and weapons. It found that helicopters could routinely evade enemy detection and engagement by flying at altitudes below 15 meters. could determine the probability of achieving first round hits with various missiles. It discovered that engaging the enemy from the maximum range of the helicopter weapons reduced the attack helicopter effectiveness only slightly, but increased survivability nearly five times. It found that attack helicopters could acquire and engage more targets in less time when employed with other means of detection, such as observation helicopters, dismounted observers, or ground troops. It found that adequate weather conditions would exist in Europe for the attack helicopter to accomplish its mission, an average of 343 days a year. Data emerging from these efforts convinced the Army that a properly designed attack helicopter could be used effectively as a tank killer in a sophisticated, mid-intensity combat environment. Advancing technology now permitted the development of the AH-56 Cheyenne, a true attack helicopter with a variety of firepower, get where needed, when needed, and the agility to take full advantage of the terrain. 
Along with the development of a prototype attack helicopter, the Army set about to perfect the tactics that it would employ. It reviewed all of the previous studies, war games, and field experiments pertaining to the attack helicopter and came up with a more advanced set of tactics. First, using scout helicopters to enhance the survivability of the attack helicopter by providing target location, direction of attack, firing positions, and holding areas, thus reducing exposure of the attack helicopter. Second, maximizing the use of cover and concealment to avoid the enemy's electronic and visual acquisition means. Third, engaging the enemy from outside the effective range of his weapons. These tactics were then played in a two-sided war game. This war game reaffirmed the idea that the attack helicopter, judiciously used by a ground commander in coordination with his other weapons, can be a decisive weapon on the modern battlefield. The Army was not content to rely solely on analytical deduction. At its instrumented range in California, a field experiment is being conducted under simulated combat conditions to further evaluate tactics, vulnerability, and survivability. Currently available U.S. scout helicopters distinctively marked to aid in identification are employed in varying combinations with present-day attack helicopters. Unfortunately, the Cheyenne is not available for this test. It is therefore necessary to use the Cobra, even though it does not have the Cheyenne's superior capabilities. These teams are pitted against an attacking enemy armored column equipped with radar and visually directed air defense systems and supported by scout helicopters. Both sides are supported by close air support aircraft. Actions of participants are recorded using event entry devices and time-synchronized tape recordings of radio transmissions. Mounted on the attack helicopters and the enemy anti-aircraft weapons are cameras which are activated when the weapons are fired. Although no live ammunition is fired, the film from these cameras assists in determining successful engagements. Radar and range measuring systems record the location of participants. On a typical trial of the field experiment, the helicopter pilots are briefed about the operation. At the same time, the enemy ground forces are being briefed on their area of operations. On this particular day, the combination of aircraft used is one scout and two attack helicopters. helicopter precedes the attack helicopters into the operational area searching for the enemy tanks. The scout pilot notes likely holding areas for the attack helicopters which would mask them from the enemy's view. detecting an enemy column, the scout pilot notifies the attack helicopters, giving target location, recommended areas from which to engage the enemy, and the direction and approximate range to the target. The scout helicopter continues to monitor the target. As the attack helicopters move forward, 
As the attack helicopters approach their attack positions, the scout helicopter moves to where it can observe for enemy aircraft, air defense weapons, and additional targets. Concurrently, the enemy radar detects helicopter activity in the area and alerts the anti-aircraft defenses in the column. Meanwhile, the attack helicopters, using the range and direction provided by the scout, prepare to engage the enemy from behind masking terrain rising only enough to see the target. As the pilot of one attack helicopter sights the enemy, he transmits what he sees to the time-sequenced recorder. When the simulated missile is launched, the gun camera is activated. With the current aerial weapon system, the attack helicopter must remain exposed until its missile impacts. Meanwhile, the enemy anti-aircraft crew has sighted the helicopter as it crested the hill. The gun camera photographs the helicopter and records the time of engagement. Subsequent analysis of the recorded data will reveal the outcome of this engagement. Missions are repeated using different crews, tactics, terrain, and combinations of aircraft. As the experiment progresses, additional data will be generated, permitting further evaluation of the tactics used. The final results of this experiment will be incorporated in later and larger field tests in the United States and Europe, evaluating the newest equipment and the latest ideas in Army units. The Army has learned a lot about how to use the helicopter in combat. It has conducted studies, war games, field experiments and tests, recorded the results, and checked the conclusions. This is the process, taking what it has already learned, using the equipment that it has now to simulate advanced equipment of the future, the Army develops the doctrine, tactics, and techniques necessary to counter the most sophisticated threat of a future enemy.